Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see you all back after your coffee break, and uh, we'll start program number three with Ezekiel chapter 47. For those of you joining us on television, again, we're just a informal Bible study. We're not associated with anybody. We are totally independent. And uh, again, we have no one underwriting us, so we do appreciate all the financial help, but more than that, the prayers and uh, all your letters. And again, I've got to make mention the fact, please do not apologize if you can't send a large offering. My goodness, $5 is just as good an offering to us as anything else, because uh, I usually uh, drop a note to someone and say, you know, with God, little is much. And uh, if you send a check for five bucks, it tells us you're praying, too. And that's what we really want, is uh, that you'll hold us up in the arms of prayer. All right. Ezekiel, chapter 47. We're going to continue on the Old Testament prophecies concerning this time that is still future. And we've been looking at all the horrors of the tribulation in the past several tapings. And that's why we're looking at the kingdom now, because that's the next event. After the Battle of Armageddon, we're going to be looking at the second coming of Christ. If not anymore this afternoon, it'll be in our next taping. But here we're still in the Old Testament promises concerning this glorious heaven on earth kingdom with the capital in Jerusalem. All right, now in Ezekiel chapter 47, Ezekiel is describing the millennial throne in Jerusalem, and I'm not going to take the time to go back to all that, but in the first verses of chapter 47 now, he's speaking of the, the, uh, the throne room there in Jerusalem as being the headwaters of this gorgeous river that's going to flow from Jerusalem to the Mediterranean to the west, and it's also going to flow to the Dead Sea to the east. All right, now we're going to pick up the one that flows east to the Dead Sea then in verse 7. Ezekiel 47, verse 7. Now get the picture. Christ is ruling from the throne room on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. From underneath will come this fountain of fresh water, half going to the Mediterranean, and half going east to the dead. All right, now verse 7. Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and the other. In other words, on both sides of this river. Then he said unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country, that is, from Jerusalem, <clears throat> go down into the desert, and go into the sea, that is, the Dead Sea which being brought forth into the sea, the waters, the Dead Sea waters, shall be healed. Now, I think you all are aware that nothing lives in the Dead Sea today. All right. Verse 9, And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither. In other words, this freshening water supply coming from this river out of Jerusalem will actually generate the Dead Sea into a fresh water sea. And all the fish then will begin to be in its habitat. All right? And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed, and everything that shall live wherever the river cometh. Now verse 10, and it shall come to pass. You know I love those words, just simply because it flies in the face of most humanity that they doubt these things, and they think that we're just grasping at something. But listen, as I've been saying for the last six months, every place I go, when it says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. You can just rest on it. And we're getting closer and closer every day. My goodness, when you see what's going on in the world and the things that are almost, like I told Iris, I'm not one to worry, but I am getting a little bit concerned, even about our own uh, beloved America, because, see, everything is so fragile. If anything collapses, the whole thing goes. I trust you all know that. 
and uh, all of a sudden our abundance might be anything but. So uh, I'm all for, you better get a little garden ready. <laughs> you better start some home garden because it could happen overnight. But anyway, when the book says that it's going to come to pass, we can see now the handwriting is on the wall. We're getting closer and closer. All right, now after the Dead Sea becomes fresh water, filled with fish, well, what follows? Fishermen. Fishermen, see? And here we come in the next verse. And it shall come to pass that the fishers, see? They will stand upon it from En Gedi. Now, those of you who've been there, En Gedi is, is a park. It's a Jewish uh, wildlife park on the on the west side of the highway and on the east side is the Dead Sea where you usually go swimming. And uh, it's a resort area now and uh, that's En Gedi. All right, so from En Gedi all the way down to En Eglium there shall be a place, spread forth their nets, their fish, see, they're going to be catching fish and it'll be according to their kinds as the fish of the Great Sea, the Mediterranean, this renovated Dead Sea is going to produce fish like you won't believe, see? And that's all part of this regeneration of the planet, making the places that were cursed the worst are going to be the most blessed. All right, now let's just move on into a little different prophetic view in Daniel. Now Daniel is going to show how that this kingdom cannot come in until the king sets everything straight. So come in in Daniel chapter 2, and this is a portion of scripture that many of you, of you have heard from other Bible teachers, you've heard it from me, and that is the vision from the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 2, and uh, let's just start at verse 31. I think you all remember the story. The king had a dream and couldn't remember what it was. And he was about to put all his magicians to death because they couldn't figure it out for him. But uh, they tell him about this Jew that uh, maybe he could do the job. And so he calls up Daniel. And Daniel, of course, by the miraculous power of his God, is able to not only recover the dream, but interpret it. And here we are in Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. Daniel is speaking. And he says, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image, or a likeness. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible or frightening. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms were of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part iron and part clay. All right, now we know from previous studies that this great image was a preview of prophecy concerning the Gentile empires that would be coming down the pipe of history. And uh, we've always shown it before that the head of gold was Babylon, the first great Gentile empire in human history. Nebuchadnezzar, and he told Nebuchadnezzar, thou art this head of gold. Then the next part of the image coming down to the chest area of silver was indicative of the next empire, which was the Medes and the Persians. And you remember the Medes and the Persians blocked off the Euphrates River and uh, the Babylonians were caught sleeping and the Mede and Persian army came in on the dry river and uh, just simply overwhelmed the Babylonians in a, in a minute of time. All right, then the next empire that usurped the Medes and the Persians was Alexander the Great, the Greek Empire. And that, of course, is indicated by the belly of brass and then, of course, the Greeks only held forth a couple, three hundred years, and then here come the Romans, the fourth great Gentile empire. And Rome not only defeated the Greeks, but enlarged their empire. 
And then you see we have another extension of this image, and that is down to his feet and toes. And here we have especially the toes designated as part iron and part clay. Now we know from our study of prophecy then that these great empires all came in their prophetic order. First the Babylonians, then came the Medes, and then came the Greeks, and then came the Romans, and then Christ was rejected and crucified under the Roman Empire. But the prophecy stopped. The clock stopped. And instead of carrying on, as our timeline shows, instead of this timeline just keeping right on going, and after the crucifixion and the ascension, the tribulation with second coming the kingdom, it stopped after his ascension. And we have the rise of the Apostle Paul, and in comes now where we've been for 2,000 years of what we call the dispensation of grace, the church age. We feel we're right out here at the final days of it. We don't know, but it certainly seems that way. We have to be taken out of the way because this body of Christ will not fit with the prophecy from the Old Testament. This is totally separated from all of this. So now we're over here at this point in time, on this timeline, we're waiting for the rapture, for the removal of the body of Christ, and then the next event is still like it is up here, the tribulation, the second coming, and the kingdom. And uh, all of this now is unfolding because we've seen these same four empires back in the news now every day. The same four empires. Babylon, of course, is Iraq. And I've said for the last three years, this is not Bush's war. This is God's war. Because Iraq has to be made ready for the end time. Now, if you want to see Iraq in the end time, I didn't intend to do this either. That's why I get off schedule. See, I shouldn't do this, but I have to. That's my way of teaching. Come back with me to Revelation. Chapter 17, if I'm not mistaken. 18. Revelation 18. Oh my goodness. Jump in at verse 1. <laughs> I was going to go all the way over to verse 9. Let's stop at verse 1. Now why am I doing this? Because of what I just said. This Iraqi war is God's war. It's getting the Middle East ready for the second coming. And this is why I feel it has to be the way it is. Because, now why do I do this? You all know that Iraq has the second greatest supply of oil of any nation on earth. Greater than anybody except maybe Saudi Arabia. All it needs is the right kind of people to come in and put it in production and get it shipped out. Well, at oil at hundred and some dollars a barrel, can you imagine the wealth that gives that little country? And you see, when you got money, you can do anything. Now, I maintain that once all the dust settles and Iraq starts pumping oil like you won't believe, and they will, just, just wait for me, it'll happen. All that money, it's already accumulating, you know. All that money will be spent to rebuild the ancient city of Babylon. And this is what you see here in Revelation. Now, when you got the money, they'll be able to build a city of two, three hundred thousand population in less than a year's time. They did it over in the Emirates in the little city called Dubai. And I'm sure you've all been seeing a little bit about Dubai. Unbelievable. Man-made lakes and golf courses out there on what was nothing but pure sand. Well, how do they do it? Money. <laughs> Money. Well, all right, if Iraq ends up with all these jillions of oil dollars, this can happen almost overnight. Okay, here we come. Revelation 18, verse 1, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And this angel cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen. Now, when I taught this ten years ago, I put 
the word Babylon here as connecting all the global system of the world, not just Babylon alone, but all the great financial centers and the whole globalized economies of the world are now going to be under the control of the Antichrist and it's going to fall, see? And that's what this chapter is all about, the end of this great Gentile financial empire. But it's fallen, and it's become the habitation of demons and the hold of every foul spirit. Verse 3, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, the kings of the earth, and so on and so forth. The merchants of the earth are waxed rich. See? Money, money, money. That's all they can think about. Through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Verse 7. How much she hath glorified herself, and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen. She's a big, new, beautiful city, but don't forget all the other financial centers of the world are all tied together. It's not just this one city alone, but on the other hand, it has to be a city because it's spoken of as such. All right. Uh, verse 7 again, I sit a queen and am no widow and I shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day. This will be at the second coming of Christ. This is what we're building up to out of our Old Testament study today. All right? And uh, death and mourning and famine. And she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. All right, now coming down to verse 9, I think we identify the city in particular. Don't forget, it's going to be... Paris and Berlin and London and New York and Chicago and San Francisco and you just go all around the globe. They're all tied together in our globalized economies. But here sits the queen of them all. All right, verse 9. The kings of the earth have committed fornication, lived deliciously with her. They'll bewail her and lament her when they shall see the smoke of her burning standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. And look at their... Their commodities, gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, linen, purple, silk, scarlet, thine wood, and all manner and vessels of ivory, all the things of the wealthy society of this globalized economy. All manner of vessels, most precious wood, brass, iron, marble, and so on and so forth, see? All right, now then come all the way down to verse 16. And they'll say, Alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls for in one hour. Now, I'm a literalist. This is going to just be almost instantaneous. For in one hour such great riches is come to nothing. Every shipmaster, which I feel will be down on the Persian Gulf, Every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stand afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? Well, I think, again, all the petrodollars are being accumulated and uh, it's going to rise up out of the dust, the most beautiful city the world has probably ever seen. The gardens of Nebuchadnezzar will be put to shame by what they'll be able to do with all this oil money. And if you doubt me, you just go to the internet or whatever and you look up the city Dubai. D-U-B-A-I. And it is unbelievable. And they built all that in just a short period of time. See, Ike knows what I'm talking about. And that's just a little foretaste of what I think they'll do in Iraq. Well, now then, back to Daniel 2. I didn't plan to do that. So here we have the great Gentile empires starting 
with Nebuchadnezzar back there in 606 BC and ending with the Roman Empire at the time of Christ. All right, about 300 and some after death, after Christ, the Roman Empire disappeared into the dustbin of human history. But now here we are. That's where I left off. Iraq is back in the news every day. That's ancient Babylon, the same place. Iraq is in the news every day. All right, the next empire were the Medes and the Persians. Well, who's Persia? Iran. And if you don't know that Iran is in the news every day, you've got your head in the dirt someplace. All right, then what's the next one? Syria. And Syria is in the news now every day. Getting closer and closer, I think, to a confrontation with Israel. All right, so that brings us up to the fourth empire, which was Rome and what's the present day Roman Empire? The European Union. And, uh, you know, like I think I shared in the last taping, way back when uh, the European Union was still in its infancy, I told my Bible classes that someday they would have their own currency. I didn't know what they'd call it. And I said, you just watch that after it finally gets on the world currency markets, it'll just gradually go right up past the American dollar, and that's where it is today. I think it's up to about a dollar and a half or more for a dollar. And it's all right here, see? All right, so now then, we are at that point in history where all these Old Testament Gentile empires are back in the news. They've all got a role of one sort or another. All right, now let's continue on reading in Daniel. So I at least finish this part of it before this program ends. So now then, verse 34, Daniel 2. After laying out these four empires with a fifth made of ten toes, which I feel is the European community. It's a revived Roman Empire. Thou sawest, he tells the king, thou sawest until a stone cut out without hands. Now I'm thinking that someday I may make an afternoon or at least a program or two on all the references through Scripture where Christ is the rock or the stone. I think it's enough for an afternoon. But over and over, Christ is referred to as the stone or the rock. You remember when Moses struck the rock? Who was the rock? Well, it was Christ. All right, here we have a stone picked in this, depicted in this prophecy. But what's unique about this stone? It's cut out without hands. So what is it? It's a supernatural boulder, a huge boulder. That's what we want to be putting in our imagination. Here comes this huge boulder with which human effort has nothing to do whatsoever. It's a miraculous thing. All right, now read on. Thou sawest a stone, which is a reference to Christ, but in its symbolism, it's a boulder. You saw a stone cut out without hands who smote the image upon his feet. Now remember, the image is standing upright. The head is Nebuchadnezzar, the chest and the legs and then the feet. All right, now when this boulder comes and strikes that image on its feet, what's the natural result? It's going to tip over. And as it tips over, what does that boulder do to the statue? Crushes it, grinds it to powder. That's the symbolism. What's the reality? When Christ comes, the, the power that be, that the Antichrist is going to be coming out of and is going to use his base will be the European, the revived Roman Empire. That's going to be the base of it all. But all these other empires' influences are still with us. But they're all going to be crushed with the second coming of Christ. Now, you got the picture? All right. So he strikes the image upon his feet, which is the revived Roman Empire, out of which the Antichrist is ruling the world. But all the influences of the Persians and the Syrians and uh, the Greeks and so forth, are still evident, but they're all going to come under that rolling stone. All right. 
He smote the image on feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. And so then, verse 35, was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold. See where we're going? We're going from feet to the legs to the belly to the chest to the head. And it's going to be utterly ground to pieces together, verse 35, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors that the wind carried them away. Which means what? There's no more evidence of them. They're completely wiped off the planet. Everything pertaining to them, see? And so no place was found for them. But now, that's not the end. What's the next part of the statement? And the stone, Jesus Christ in his second coming, the stone that smote the image became a great kingdom, mountain in the King James, became a great kingdom that filled the whole earth. All right, now we've got to make one more reference. I'm not through in Daniel. I may come back next time, next half hour, I don't know. But now come over quickly in the minute we have left to Zechariah. Next to last book in your Old Testament. Zechariah, because I want you to see how the language is exactly the same. Daniel depicts this great kingdom as filling the whole earth. Not just the Middle East, not just Israel. It's going to be an earthly kingdom covering the whole. All right, Zechariah 14. There again, I've got to watch my time. I think I've got time. Starting at verse 1. Here are the closing stages of the tribulation as we saw it in our last taping. When everything is going to be utterly reduced to nothing so that God can start out with a totally cleansed earth. All right, then verse 3. The Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Verse 4. And his feet, his second coming. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the earth. All right, now then skip across the page, at least my Bible, to verse 8. And here we'll have to close. Now verse 8. And look at the identical words that we saw in Daniel. And it shall be in that day, or I'm sorry, verse 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And in that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. And that kingdom is going to fill the earth from one end to the other, and it's going to be like a Garden of Eden. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.